Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Art Cast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together and um, engage with the many topics that, tends, that tend to cross one's path when one embarks on this endeavor of communicating with images. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Droz. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... Hey, I'm Rob Stenzinger. I do user experience design, interactive design, and I like to teach and coach all about that stuff. Hi, Good Jersey. to see How you. you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, good to see you again. We're, we're on a streak. Haven't done any rebroadcasts in a while. Um, and back for another episode where we take on a topic. We usually look at it like what it looks like in the front end of the show. In the second half, we unpack sort of why this, this topic is important to us or how we think about this topic. This week, we're going to do something a little different. We're introducing a new segment on the show. Right on, yeah. So the this segment is a follow up to the thing we started last week, which is the two minute practices, mm. and this will be an ongoing conversation, and hopefully, uh, just uh, highlighting and surfacing, celebrating just this uh, this idea that uh, we don't have to do giant creative challenges to um, to you know get better and try to fit that in with our regular uh, you know other commitments and whatnot we can just do little practices with less pressure uh, less time less effort but get more out of it eventually because it's mm -hmm. about long-term gain yeah it, it ties into a topic we've talked about many times in the show is this whole concept of whittling and trusting in the process of whittling right because um, the, the 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 difficulty with it, it like in doing like these tiny chunks of effort is it makes the um, accumulation of effort or the skill building relatively invisible. You don't know what's happening until way later. Um, but something you've proposed that I think is really an interesting, interesting idea is sort of creating checkpoints uh, to, you know, reflect on what has been happening so that maybe some of that accumulation of skill building will become more apparent because you're, you know, making a, making a point out of stopping and looking at it. Right. Um, yeah. And with it all, it's not about uh, lowering the pressure in one area to then increase the pressure in, a, in another area. It's all meant to be a, um, like a really easy thing to fit in your day. So mm -hmm. if you make it take two minutes or if it interrupts you for four minutes, because you need to, you know, move your, you know, move your coffee cup aside and make some space to do your practice or to push your chair aside to do some fitness related things or to look something up quick. But either way, you're going to be done in a very few amount of minutes. And yeah. uh, then there's a little piece of that where you just have a two minute timer in the background that has your back. So it's like, well, you're, you're not meant to disappear into this forever. It's just a, you know, two minute practice, literally. And uh, our first round, we'll follow up on this later. Are we going to, yeah, I assume this segment will come up later on, right? Yeah, yeah. It'll be in the second half of the show. So um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change the flow of things a little bit for how we typically do things. But I'm looking forward to introducing a little novelty in the show. Um, can we talk about a, like two little newsy things at the top before we dive into the topic this week? Um, I'm going to be, in the weeks to come, I'm going to start making a lot of noise about two comics festivals. And there's like, kind of a good reason for both. Um, the first one is the Ann Arbor Comic Arts Festival is uh, coming up this summer. It's not far away. Um, and uh, the thing that just dropped on there is the open ballot for the Kids Comics Awards. So the Kids Comics Awards is this annual awards uh, that's, that's for comics made for kids and only kids get to vote on the winners. And something we started doing in recent years is putting out at the top of the year an open ballot for like kids to nominate who they want to be on the short list. So that it's like kids get to choose all the way through. They get to choose the nominees and they get to choose the winners. And so um, there's an online ballot and a printable ballot that you can get at kid, uh, a2caf.com. Uh, there's a link in the side where it says kid, Kids Comic Awards 2020. Um, or you can just choose uh, the, the URL, a2caf.com slash kcawards. Um, if you got a young person in your life who enjoyed a comic that came out in 2019, they can nominate that person. If you are a cartoonist who made a comic, and it doesn't have to be a published comic, it could be self-published. If you made it in 2019, you could tell your constituency if they have young people in their lives to nominate you. Um, and then uh, the final, the short list will be posted, or the final nominees will be posted in May, and then the final winners will be announced in June at A2CAF. 
the other one I'm going to make some noise about next week a lot more, but we didn't talk about this before, uh, Rob, was um, I got named uh, executive interim executive director of Cartoon Crossroads Columbus here in Columbus, Ohio. Um, that is awesome news. Congratulations, <laughs> Jersey. This is That's super cool. Cartoon Thanks. Crossroads is a great event, and that sounds like... Uh, like a big weight on your shoulders now. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like uh, the word responsibility written in all caps in the sky in fire. Um, and it, I mean, when when I when I first moved to Columbus, like uh, it was a natural thought. I've I've been to every cross car, cartoon crossroads Columbus festival. One of the things I love about this festival is they've cracked the code on how siloed different comics communities can be. Is they have a show where the explicit intent, like so, a two calf has the explicit intent of celebrating family comics that the whole family can enjoy and really leaning into that and like leaning into like celebrating kids comics authors and comics that are like all ages. What CXC has done that makes them unique is they say all comics, whether it's comic strips, political cartoons, um, editorial cartoons, comic books, graphic novels, um, horror comics, Western comics, superhero comics, uh, quote unquote mainstream diamond direct comics, uh, mini comics, zines, they are all celebrated in this place. And so you can have somebody like a Brian Michael Bendis, who is like the celebrated mainstream comic book guy who wrote Spider-Man for a long time, is writing a bunch of DC comics now, Superman. And you can have him in the same area as Seth, who did his good life if you don't weaken, and Clyde fans. And nobody thinks it's weird. It, they all just belong here because all comics are celebrated. So I fell in love with the show from the start. Uh, and when I moved to Columbus, I remember thinking like, oh, gosh, maybe they'll be awake and help out with that show now that I'm there all the time. Um, I did not expect it to happen this way. I didn't want it to happen this way because the previous director, Tom Spurgeon, you know, unexpectedly passed away in November. And, um, you know, when they asked me, I said, like, you know, I, I can't fill that man's shoes. And they said, well, you'll have all of us to help you. And I said, well, I'll be counting on that. Um, so and, I, and that's what I've been telling everybody. It's like, it's not the way I want it to help, uh, but I'm glad I can be here to help and heavily emphasis have heavy emphasis on the word interim. Um so, yeah, for the next year, I'm going to be uh, acting as executive director of the show, which means that I'm going to be making a lot of noise about things happening at the show. I already did in the past, but, um, you know, I'm going to be doing a lot more of that, especially uh, starting next week. So just want to make a note of that at the top before we dive into the topic. Um, that's, that's really, yeah, what a, uh, what a cool, uh, exciting opportunity. And I think this is a, this is a great place to make noise about that. I mean, we're typically there's there's a variety of different flavors of visual storyteller and designer and maker folk who i mean that you know we're a lot of us are pretty into that kind of thing the the comic <laughs> community it's it's so yeah i think it's relevant and exciting and be it'll be cool to hear the uh i don't know your different news and whatnot uh, along the way and i bet there might be a topic or two to unpack in some kind of curious, inquisitive, respectful way here and there. Do well, yeah. I mean, well, also related to that, I was reading your recent Medium post about introducing UX to an organization. And I was like, oh, yeah, this, this is a lot of the thoughts in here are things that I'm wrestling with right now as I begin working with a very large and complex organization and, and that serves a lot of different communities. So how can I bring this kind of thinking to this organization? Um, so, and, and what's, what's your medium address, Rob? Is it just Rob Stenzinger? Oh, yeah, it's just uh, Rob Stenzinger. I don't share that URL that much. So it's, if I type it in my browser, what pops up? Uh, it's a medium.com slash at Rob, Rob Stenzinger, Stenzinger, all one word. And this, uh, uh, yeah, so I just have, I have two articles so far, um, put plenty of work into them. I, I feel good about them, but uh, you know, the number two isn't a huge number, but then there's, um, yeah, so one of them is practicing UX, being there when a team is starting their first design journey. And it's not saying like, oh, this is only relevant to UXers or whatnot, too. It's like anytime you're, yeah, I mean, you're in an, in an organization where folks are starting to just sort of change how they make decisions. Lots of stuff shakes out. And this is, this is sort of encouragement and so hopefully some practical food for thought for that kind of event. And then I just published uh, like a day ago this article about uh, assumptions. And I think assumptions are actually pretty awesome. I know when I was growing up, there was always this thing that folks would say as a piece of wisdom. And, you know, it's like, you know, you know what assumptions do? They make a butt out of you and me, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
And we're like, really? What happens? And so, but, you know, later, fast forward uh, to, you know, years into my career, I'm like, assumptions are awesome because this is where you get to do your uh, thinking and connecting together and hopefully may have you in a, making a safe place to do that instead of mm -hmm. like, so assumptions aren't bad, just ignoring them and making stuff without addressing them is probably where things actually go wrong. So there's a whole lot of good food for thought there. And that's the kind of thing I'll, I'll continue to, uh, to explore. On, on in my medium posts cool so you should follow them there everybody um okay so topic time uh what are we talking about this week we're talking about character design uh, it's it's a topic that i feel like i almost uh pathologically avoid when doing podcasts um and i think it's because i think very early on when i way back when i was doing the art and story podcast like over 10 years ago now um, I remember when my co-hosts and I would like try to put together topics week to week, somebody would say character design and everybody in the room would groan like, Oh, come on. That's just such a, that's such an easy go to there. It feels like it's so it's such an obvious choice. And so as, as a result, I've just avoided it all these years. Like I just don't talk about it a whole lot. Um, and then I recently started a character design course at the Columbus college of art and design. And now I'm thinking about it all the time again. And I mean, I always thought about it in my comics classes, but it was a smaller component of a larger collection of exploration. So now it's like, here's 10 weeks where this is all we're talking about. And it occurred to me that like, hey, you know what, since I'm sort of hip deep in this topic anyway, and because I noticed that I have this almost pathological aversion to talking about it, maybe I should bring it to the show again and let's explore it again. Um, it might feel fresh after, what, eight something years of doing this project together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah no doubt this is I'm, I'm really glad that uh you you brought this up it's uh it's always a thing like if i do a workshop or a talk and then i bring it to the show us interacting hits new angles no matter mm -hmm. what so mm -hmm. hopefully that is useful for you and uh and you know the leaners will enjoy uh this exploration because uh i mean it's yeah it, it's it's come up in our in our topic history in a couple of different ways but not yeah, not so. I I don't know why, I don't know why we've avoided it so much. So well, I well, I, I just shared why I think I do, but I um, I wasn't, I I couldn't have, I couldn't have uh, described that myself. So okay, um, uh, and and it was it was certainly through no uh interaction with you that I've I've developed this aversion. It it has more to do with like you know just previous experience doing podcasts. It's just for some reason it's just something I just didn't talk about. Um even 80 something episodes of the comics great show. I don't know if we did that many episodes on character design. Um and so anyway, um I thought for a different kind of spin on it. I was like, well, how could I make this useful to the leaners? Well, what if I just shared a couple of the exercises that I do in my classes as a way to say like, hey, if you are a working professional or if you're a teaching artist, here's something you can either, uh, respectively speaking, it uses a warm-up exercise to get you thinking a new way about uh, exploring your character designs in your projects or if you're working with uh, young people, this is something you can use in your classroom uh, as a cool drawing exercise to teach narrative, you know, uh, visual storytelling, introduce visual storytelling into whatever kind of curriculum based content you've got. So uh, with that, I should it, we are overdue for me to hit some music. Where's the music? There it is. Give it away when you, you, you say it like that. Hit some music. All right. <laughs> Brace yourself, Rob. All right. Okay. So, um, it's, I feel, <laughs> I feel, um, like I should sort of queue up or frame up how I explore this with my classrooms because, um, I'll, I'll repeat some words a parent once said to me when they witnessed some of my classroom activities happening and then they picked up their kids and they said to me like, wow, you're teaching writing and drawing at the same time. I thought your class was going to be about just how to draw things. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't really teach how to draw things. Uh, I teach how to express one's ideas through images. That's like sort of my approach. I'm not saying this is the right or wrong approach. This is just my approach. And, you know, like there are going to be other teachers who will teach you the actual like technical illustration skills. Right. Um, but that's not that's not what I tend to explore in my classroom. So um, I'm going to pull up on screen. I want to uh, frame up, like, what do I mean when I say, like, drawing visually? Um, we haven't talked about this in a while on the show, Rob. Or if we have, stop me and tell me, like, oh, we're, this is fresh in our minds. But, like, the four tools of cartooning. Do you remember this? Um, 
I think it comes up, but it's it's really important to uh, to lay this context. All right, I will I will because, blast because they're this. building blocks, right? I mean, it's yeah. it's not yeah, they're really important building blocks for uh, having. I guess more expressive, more choices. You can make decisions about each of these building blocks too. You can think of them as four design principles, four design concepts. Uh, and the way I describe it to my students is I say like, it's, it's like molecules. It's like, there's like these weird little building blocks that are indistinguishable from one another when you look at them as building blocks, but then when you recombine them in different ways, you get water, you get air, you get lava, you get vomit, you know? It's incredible how you just rearrange the blocks and you get a whole variety of different substances with different characteristics. Same thing in visual storytelling. So I, I break it down to four basic uh, design principles that we recombine to communicate visually. And the first one, I'll do this really fast, is shape. And the simple idea of thinking about this is, you know, different shapes make us feel different things. It's like a visual adjective, right? Smooth shapes make us think of non-threatening things um, like babies, you know, and we see a chubby little baby waddling towards us. We don't think anything of it uh, unless we have an aversion to children, you know, we might say like, uh, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to deal with well, any poopy diapers. Sure, exactly. But, Concerned about responsibility, or <laughs> yeah. But but or, like the form itself doesn't feel terribly threatening. But you know, then I say to my students, "Behold the terror of Triangle Baby," and I draw this thing. We say, "Oh Lord, no! What is that thing? Make it go away." And then I say, "Well, uh, what's an adjective? An adjective is is a word that describes a noun. Noun." Baby, noun, baby. I change the shape of that baby. It changes how you feel about the baby. So we can think of shapes as visual adjectives, right? I think you kind of just made Baby Yoda, though, in my opinion. <laughs> but Baby Yoda, if you want to look at it, it's like got a lot of smooth shapes with those big animal like eyes, like little kitten eyes. Uh huh. Right? Like there's a lot that's not threatening about Baby Yoda. Right. And also, like what I, I tell the students is I'm like, triangles aren't evil. They're just dangerous and dynamic. Right. And Baby Yoda is certainly dangerous. Well, I know you have size. So I think yeah. one, one interesting thing about the last the, the, the triangle baby you made is that mm. through size and association with baby proportions, all of a sudden, yes. I think cuteness popped out. Yes. Yeah. So then the second tool or the second molecule is size. And when I say I draw two angry guys and I ask the students, which one's angrier? We invariably say the larger one is angrier. Why? Because this comes from our re regular experience. When you want to tell a secret and you don't want to be noticed, when you want to seem less uh, obtrusive, you get small, you make your body small. When you want to get somebody's attention across a large space, you get big, big equals loud, big equals emphasis, big equals power. So yes, if we saw baby Yoda, like this, and here's this my very crude drawing, and then here's our Mandalorian, right? Oh yeah. Yep. Suddenly it oh. changes how it feels, yep. right? Just just by virtue of just changing its size, right? So it's like you combine shapes and sizes in different ways, you get you come to different um, assumptions or expectations about the thing. The third tool is line. And I, I think of this as visual poetry, right? And like poetry is not literal. Like if I say, and I'm quoting Joseph Campbell now, um, oh, Rob, you are a rose. Oh, Rob, you are a swan. And if Rob says, make up your mind, he's not understanding what I'm saying, right? Exactly. Yeah, he's like, one or the other. Well, no, you can be both because I'm not literally saying you're a swan. I'm saying you're awesome in, in non-literal language. And lines work the same kind of way. So like if you take this uh, smooth line and this jagged line and I say which one's the calm line, we're invariably going to say the straight line. Why? Because we make assumptions or associations like, oh, it's like a cardiogram. He's dead. You know, there's nothing more calm than that versus, oh, he's alive, you know, in the cardiogram. Uh, or... When we think of smooth line and wavy line, we think, okay, it's happy day in a boat versus, oh, Lord, no, choppy water, poor guy. Hope somebody rescues him, right? Well, what's this got to do with, with characters? <laughs> what's it got to do with character design? Well, if I draw that angry guy again, now I'm not going to change his size, right? Right. And then how does that change the way we feel about him, right? Oh, he was angry. Yeah, it's he was shaking to the point of. Yeah, angry versus furious, wow. right? Because, because like, 
you know, a literal minded person to say, well, that line's not really moving. But people who understand visual poetry are going to understand that this is like he's trembling with rage. And even if he's not literally using a wavier line, like if you look at Charles Schultz's early work versus his later work, it changes the dynamic and the characteristic of the designs by virtue of just a, a, a more scratchier, wavier line. Mm. And the th fourth tool is color. Color makes us feel things. And the very, very... I will try to do this as quickly as possible. The movie Inside Out, about the girl with feelings in her head. They all had different colors, right? There was joy, there was sadness, there was anger, and there was disgust, and there was uh, fear. By the way, this is by no means an academic chart. This is just a framework for thinking about how we associate colors with feelings, right? Uh, joy was mostly yellow. And sadness was mostly blue, anger was red, disgust was green, and fear was purple, right? And when, because when we think of red, we think of anger because maybe we feel hot when we're angry, we get flushed when we're angry, but we also blush when we find out that secret crush knows that we have a secret crush on them. Red is the color of anger, red is the color of love. Holy cow, how about that? February 14th, Valentine's Day, everything's pink and red. Yeah, and the interesting color wheel thinking going on here, too. As far a little as relationships. bit. Yep. Yeah, yeah. The colors. Yeah. So what is fear? It's a bit of sadness and anger. Sa sadness yeah. and anger. And then also, so I want to point out that these are opposite emotions, right? But they also have a target. I'm angry with you. I love you. Both have a target. They're outward pushing feelings. Oh, blue, yeah. blue equals sadness because we think of rainy days, cloudy skies, but also big open ocean, big open spring sky. It's the color of calm, right? And that those are both yeah. inward pointing feelings like, oh, I don't need to go to the party. I'm feeling really mellow today. Or I don't want to talk to anybody right now. I'm, I'm too sad, right? So cool colors are inward pulling feelings. Warm colors are outward pushing feelings. Um, and so then we got this opposite thing going on starting right away. Like green is the color of disgust. We think of rotting, vomit, putrefaction, and so on. But then green is also the color of grass, trees, life. It's the color of growing things and dying things, right? Depending on how you use it and what shade and what hue you use. So then we get the two that are like based on cultural assumptions, as, as I see it. Um, purple's the color of fear. Well, what's the opposite of being fearful? Well, I think of like medieval times who wore a lot of purple, right? Nobility, right? Uh, the rich people, powerful people, because color purple was a hard color to manufacture. And so purple became associated with doesn't that doesn't literally mean but associated with like nobility and loyalty mm -hmm. well yeah we are sensible or sensitive to scarcity and it, mm -hmm. it's it affects our perception of value so that, that makes sense yeah it's just it's just a cultural association that gets made like the pope wears an amethyst ring signifying his loyalty to the almighty right purple is like the color of um like a, like a noble person, not a noble person as somebody who's just rich and born into power, but a noble person who behaves with a noble character. Do they steal from children? No. Do they lie to people? No. They're very they're they're chivalrous. They are respectful and they care about ma looking after everybody else. Fear. I would change this to the word mystery. Hmm. Mystery is what causes fear, right? Um, and when we think of Voltron, legendary defender, what color are the Galra? They're purple. What color are their computers? They're purple. What color is the Black Lion's uh, color trail it makes when it forms Voltron? Black Lion being a, a lion that was once owned by a Galra. Purple, right? Wizards wear purple. Purple is the color of mysterious things. We associate it with that, right? Um, yellow, we think of Joyce. We think of big, sunny, uh, like warm summer days. But then there's that old expression. Again, this is a cultural association. Um, you're nothing but a yellow-bellied sidewinder. What am I saying about that person? Uh, you, infer, I think you're inferring they pee their pants out of fear. To be honest, <laughs> yes, gross. they're coward. Yeah. yeah, right. Uh, and so, cowardice is different than fear. Cowardice is how you react to fear. Whether you're brave or a coward is a uh, response to your character in the face of feeling fear, which everybody feels. Right. So again, this isn't academic. This is by no means something I would put in a book and say like, here is the definitive color association chart that you should think that you should be uh, considering. But it's something that I think about a lot. And it's a framework for approaching this idea of um, how I approach and, and explore character design with my students. Now, with that said, let me pull up um, some examples that I use in the classroom and then we'll dive into the activities. So where did my, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to pull up on screen. Here is 
two character designs from the 2008 cartoon series Transformers Animated. And one of the reasons I use these is because uh, Derek Wyatt did such a magnificent job of ex exploring this concept the way I explore it in my classroom is when you look at Starscream, what do we notice? What shape, size, line, or color has he used in the character to telegraph <laughs> that he's not a nice character, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's quite pointy and uh, almost bat-like. Mm -hmm. He's got um, pointy toes. <laughs> he's got pointy fingers, pointy wings. His his like shoulder cannons are pointy. Um, he's got like like colors that have like a, a little bit of extra black in them. Like he's he's basically a lot of his colors are the same as Optimus Prime's colors on the left, but like they've added black to them to darken them up a little bit, right? Um, Optimus, you look at him; he's mostly squares and smooth shapes. His colors are red, white, and blue. Oh, say, can you see? Right, like it's like saying, "Oh, well, he must be a good guy." He's got our flag's colors on him, after all. Um, so you can see how, like, it's a very this is a very simplified approach to this idea, but uh, you can take it into more uh, sophisticated areas when you start looking at like even nineteen seventies, you know, Marvel characters. When we look at Annihilus on the right and Batroc the Leaper on the left. And I mean, I use this example specifically for body language. When we look at Batroc, we can make some guesses about his personality based on his pose. And we make guesses about Annihilus based on his pose. But also, let's just look at the shapes and the colors they used, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the the combination of colors does feel more uh, sickly with the with the um, character on the right. I don't know their yeah. names, to be honest. Yeah, um, it's okay. It, I chose them specifically because the students wouldn't know who they were because they're not like prominent in the Marvel movies. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so let's see more. Let's see more. I guess the sickly side of the green, the the yeah, and the, yeah, the yellowish green with like the the bright magenta for his like torso color, and then like spikes all over the guy, bat wings. Um, you can take two characters who are both good guys and use shape and, and color to express very different ideas, right? Like this is mm -hmm. why Batman's covered in points because he comes across as dangerous and dynamic, not evil, dangerous and dynamic, right? Look at the, how square most of the Superman shapes are, et cetera. Smooth lines on his cape versus the pointy lines on Batman's cape, right? And then you could even take two characters who have exactly the same color scheme and express very different ideas about what to expect from them based on the shapes you use, and the body language you use, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, and, and and it worked. It worked because uh, you can encode. It, it's about I, as you're pointing out all these different uh, elements and choices, and uh, it becomes it, it's a system to navigate. There's symbols that you get to take on, and you get to use in in any way you wish you can you can use green for life you can use green for sickness you can use all that the points can can be um like what kind of character are they on is it a heroic you know probably help you character like batman but does it make him a little scary yeah because and so all these these choices can uh it just it's a it's a structure to work within that doesn't dictate the outcomes but it does give you the ability to um um, to purposefully construct and then to sort of add extra layers of encoding in your message. And then, so of course, like Sonic and Mario being, um, there's, I mean, there's a lot of interesting design choices between there, between those two, as far as, um, well, I mean, Sonic is an animal, <laughs> uh, but <laughs> very humanoid and, yeah. and that's, that's interesting too. So it's just like, you can even add like sort of, um, theme, and um, like other associations where, where maybe, maybe you're more willing to identify with Sonic because you're, you already are human and maybe you're not a human similar enough to Mario. So you might go like, eh, I don't know about that. So mm -hmm. they're interesting choices, even though um, maybe Sonic's attitude is not as much of your, your style, but anyway, it's fun to try on. And it, obviously he screams attitude, but uh, yeah. Anyway, I know you're you're moving on to other examples. Oh well, just just very very quickly, uh, like mm -hmm. if you look at uh, Disney villains, these are really good examples that demonstrate these ideas very clearly. I'm not suggesting that all character designs should be this simple and direct, but they are good examples for considering how these things get used. So you can have a much more complex design. I'll show some and much more subtle design. I'll show some really quick before we dive into the exercises. But if you look at Maleficent. 
The woman is covered in points, the color purple, the color of mystery, black, the color of death, the sickly green on her face. And then there's just enough red in there to suggest like there's some dangerous rage boiling down inside of that woman, right? Um, because after all, she does turn into a really, really nasty dragon at the end of the movie. Um, versus, say, Hades from the 1997 Hercules movie, who is also a villain, but look at all the smooth shapes they put on him in addition to the triangles, right? And you can tell through the combination of shape and body language that he is a dangerous uh, villain, but he's not as frightening and as, as uh, malevolent as Maleficent, right? Just by virtue of the pose, by virtue of the shapes, right? A little smoother, a little softer. And if, if you've seen the, the 1997 Disney Hercules movie, Hades is really funny. Um, but, you know, you can use it in much more subtle ways. Like, I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with Frozen. I'm sure you are, Rob. You have two daughters. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. And not to spoil... Awesome. Not to spoil anything, but take a look at the head shape on the guy in the far right. Look at the triangles all over him. I can't imagine that these were not intentional signals to us to say, like, watch out, right? Maybe a little bit more dangerous than you think. Whereas guy on the far left, head is much more rounded and much more square. This is the kind of stuff that I can't help but notice all the time when I'm watching these movies. Right. And it's not like it, it, this, this character design has the burden of carrying every bit of information, but it, it's helping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can use it to suggest and imply both to telegraph, but also to defy expectation. Right. I mean, like uh, another example that I use is no face who is a, 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 uh, from spirited away, who is a super creepy character in different contexts. Right. And another context is really sweet. Like when he's helping wind yarn for uh, you, Baba's sister, it's a really sweet moment. And when he's riding the train with uh, Chihiro, uh, it looks it's very peaceful and sweet. So versus moments before where he's eating everybody in sight. So um, I'm not <laughs> suggesting that your character should be walking around saying, hello, I'll be your villain for the day. And here's all my imagery to suggest the villainy, you know, um, but you can, but you, but these are tools that we read into. Uh, and these are things that work on us um, without us being terribly aware that it's happening. Um, when it's done effectively, it should just like work on you um, rather than have to be something that you have to like read into code. So um, you're really into this stuff. Unless, yeah, yeah, unless you like you've just always got that eye open all the time. Um so how about we explore one of the character design exercises? Um and uh hmm. did you want I, which one sounds more interesting to you, Rob? Well, I think one is more visual inherently. Um okay. I think so I think the the redesign challenge is Okay. is more visual on its own. If Feels like mm -hmm. we're we're just going that kind of direction. What do you think? Okay, um, let me pull up something on that regard then in my browser. Okay, um, so the one that I'll I'll point people at that I've been doing for literally ten years, more than ten years now, um, is and I post about this on my Instagram all the time. You can look through my Instagram feed; you can find lots and lots of images of me doing this exercise. And I call it the He-Man Redesign Challenge. Although I would say it doesn't have to be He-Man. The the principle behind this exercise is that you pick a cartoon that you're not super familiar with. Something. And the reason I choose cartoons is one, I like cartoons. Two, again, like the examples I was using, cartoon design tends to be very simple and direct and it's meant to work um, instantly. It's not meant to be sophisticated and require a lot of prior knowledge and a lot of visual fluency to understand, right? It's meant for everybody to understand. Um, so you pick a cartoon from some series that you don't have a whole lot of familiarity with. There's this great site called Tubi.tv, and they have a whole bunch of old cartoons on there, including some great old animes from like the 70s. Have you have you checked out Tubi TV, Rob? I haven't. I've heard you mention this, but isn't this um, something that you've mentioned on your Four Million Years Later podcast? Yeah, which we'll talk about uh, later on. Oh, come on. I don't play Transformers right now, Tubi TV. I'm just trying to pull up Tubi so we can look at some of the shows that i've got it's in my tubi.tv 
Yes. T-U-B-I dot TV. And I want to pull up some of the ones I've been watching on the treadmill recently that are like just some seriously far out uh, old animes. Um, Guy King was one of them. Oh, come on. Where's my where's my feed? Where's my cue to be? <laughs> um, well, I'll just I'll just share my browser anyway, and I'll try to. Fo- so you're not just watching me scroll through. Um, OK, so let me see. Docu series free on Tubi, trending now on TV. Preschool, they got a lot of they got a lot of movies on here too, as you can see. Um, but it's it's free, um, and it's basically trying to like compete with Netflix, but with like a lot of like stuff that's out of the way and not as available on the other services. Um, yeah, intriguing. I wonder. Uh, so this is commercial supported, I imagine. Yeah, it had they run ads. Okay. Um, I I am baffled that I can't find. Oh, I'm not signed in. That's why it's not showing my feed. So anyway, um, I guess I can pull up like just uh uh what was that one called? Uh, Guy King, I want to say there it is. So they got ones like this, you know, like old '70s animes with like really far out character designs for like the heroes and the villains. And I would just recommend that you just um you select an episode to watch and this is the first part of this exercise is i would say it's fairly intellectually intense um so you watch an episode and you're watching for three characters who need a uh, a redesign based on the following criteria like so you're watching you're saying like okay that character needs to be redesigned how do you know how do you know that character needs to be redesigned so you're asking yourself while the show's airing what do you think the creators intended but didn't deliver on, right? So in other words, I think that character is supposed to be funny. I don't think that their design is very funny. It doesn't strike me as like surprising me in any kind of pleasant and joyful way. Um, or it, it's, I think they're supposed to be silly, but they just don't look very silly. Uh, oh, I think the character was supposed to be really scary the way they're acting about him in the, in the episode, but there's nothing that visually that makes me say scary and there's nothing in the show's context that I'm picking up on that suggests they're scary despite something like they're just supposed to be scary, right? Well, what would you change thinking about shape, size, line and color? What would you change in order to enhance that? Right? Um, so in other words, what do you think would enhance the clarity of the, of the design? How could you make the design more clear and, uh, or, how do you think you might defy expectations? How could you make it more sophisticated than maybe what it is? Um, so this isn't this isn't about like looking for what's cool and what's not cool. Oh, that you know, like I, I do this design this this uh, activity with my my students in class, and every once in a while, somebody will be like, "He man needs clothes." I'm like, "Okay, why? Why does he need clothes? Explain why he needs clothes." Well, he just looks dumb. Fine, that's a perfectly legitimate reaction. <laughs> But you gotta dig deeper. Is it dumb to in the context of the story? Does it not fit in the story? Is it dumb for the audience? Does it, would you think the audience is gonna think it's dumb? Why do you think they're gonna think it's dumb? Let's explore your assumption here. Let's explore your reaction to it. You're having a reaction. That's good. Now let's expand on it and be thoughtful about how we would, you know, uh, act on that reaction, um, and put in the context of what you're reacting to. Um, so while you're watching, and this is what I have my students do, I'm like, this is a very active activity. This isn't just sitting back and enjoying a cartoon. You have to write notes. You write out the character's name if you know it or just describe the character and write down three to four things that you would change and why you would change it. Give yourself some action items while the show's running. You know, So it's like, well, uh, Man at Arms has green skin and why does he have green skin oh is it like a bodysuit well that doesn't seem like a very effective thing maybe the bodysuit needs to be enhanced more to show that it's a bodysuit so we don't jump to the assumption that he's got green skin right something like that um tila's not wearing a whole lot of armor but she's doing a lot of fighting so what would i do about her outfit in order to enhance? or uh this was something that came up this last week in my class they like everybody looks really really grown up in this and I don't feel like this is very um, accessible to, like I asked the, the the group of kids, I'm like, who do we think this cartoon is for? And they're like eight-year-olds. I'm like, okay, so given that, that it's for eight-year-olds, 
what do you think was a glaring problem with some of the designs? Well, they look too grown up for eight year olds to really like it. They should, they should look younger. I'm like that's, that's a reasonable I idea to explore. Let's explore it. Right? So the first part is you're just writing. So then you choose those three, you take those three characters and you redesign them. You're going to draw them. You're going to do a full color illustration of them. And you're asking yourself the following questions while you're doing these, these changes. Like, how are you servicing the story? You know, how are you servicing the audience? Um, and explain how you're using. So I have them actually write notes on the side. Like, how are you using shape, size, line, and color to improve the clarity or to defy the expectations? What did you add? Why did you choose this shape and not that shape? You know, um, people will change. Skeleton. Somebody did a really cool new version of Skeletor this last week where he was much more angular and he was much more emaciated and kind of hunched over like the Grim Reaper. I'm like, well, I think he was supposed to be like a, a demonic villain and he just came across as like a muscly dude with a skull head and it didn't make any sense to me. He sh it seemed like if you want him to seem like a creature from hell, he should be more stretched and ang and angle like like a shark. I'm like, there you go. That's that's a good a good approach. I'm not saying that. I would necessarily want to buy the toy, <laughs> kind of grown up with it the way I grew up with it. But, but I, I get, I get what that, what's behind that, that, that uh, redesign approach. So, but um, the the thing that I have to keep drilling home to my students is this is not about making something cool because like, oh, it just looks cooler if he has a gun now. Well, maybe <laughs> if you look, Skates, if you like, and shades, right? That's that's what they would have done in the '90s. We had a '90s up this he man skateboard, <laughs> boom. Oh well, yeah, yeah, it's like I, maybe I feel like I should front end all of these classes with the episode of The Simpsons where Poochie shows up, right? Oh, like just watch that scene. <laughs> Put sunglasses on him, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's 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 really hard to drill home this idea that it's not about making it cool; it's about in evaluating who it's for and driving the design towards more clarity to servicing the people who it's for, and what you are inferring is the creator's intention behind the idea you know um uh, and then yeah two things that uh, that seem like they can stand out just from the exercise so far is the um the sort of things that jump out immediately that may be sort of difference in cultural uh context so yep he-man not having clothes tila not having enough clothes well also you know similar in different reasons and the uh, like how that feels now, but then following that as a signal to then unpack and, and explore. And inherently the, um, there, there is, this is a very renewable resource because we're always, you know, tastes do, you know, evolve a, a bit over time. And if you, you know, look back far enough in time for your, for your source material, you're, you're always going to come up with that. There's going to be some way that the message was encoded back then that seemed more fitting then now, mm -hmm. just like things you're making now will seem less fitting 10, 20 years from now. And yeah, so and so it continues. There's there's the so there's that sort of renewable cultural context uh, change deficit. Well, I don't know what to call it. And um, but then it, it but how how handy that is where it's just this, it, it's almost guaranteed to pop up and then you can follow it as a signal to, mm -hmm. you know, to start to understand the mechanisms and intentionality of it. Um, and then, yeah, maybe that, I think I wove my two points together. Well, yeah, and I, th I think what you're pointing to is a good way to frame up this, this, what you're really doing here is look at the original she cartoon versus the Noel Stevenson DreamWorks Netflix series. And I have my students watch the intro to the original she cartoon versus the new one. And I say, what do we notice that's different? And one of the things that stands out right away is they say, oh my gosh, there's a lot of different body types in the new she -Ra. I'm like, yeah. Isn't that interesting? Like when you watch the original She-Ra, all the heroes are standing in a row at the end of the opening credits and they all the women are shaped exactly the same way, which like as a child in the 80s, I didn't think anything of it. Right? It was just like, oh, yeah, that's their heroes. That's all. You know, and then when I see it in the context of like, here's what this looks like through the lens of 2019, 2020. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, that looks antiquated now. That looks archaic, you know, and that's part it of does. the sex. Yeah. And it's and it's what's funny is like and it permeates the whole project where it's like you can think of something as a constraint as an asset. Well, hey, they're all the same shape because we manufacture the figures all in the same shape. Yeah, it lets us you know produce this more efficiently, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> And you could make the argument that it makes the animation easier because there's only one body type. But then one could make the, the counter argument. Yeah, but then there's all these all these other fant fantastical characters with different body types in the show. So 
Mm, come on, you could have done exactly. Yeah, so it, it doesn't really hold up. It's like that was yeah. a convenient thing to adopt uh, as a limitation. That it worked for that project at the time. Yep. Yet, um, it it wouldn't hold up as a as a constraint anymore. So, and that, and it points it points to the artist that this is a dialogue that you get to engage with with the culture and with the art that you make. And yeah. so let's let's use this as an opportunity to question and to evaluate and to ask ourselves what we think is true. And that's what we're going to express through our art as well. Um, but I know I pulled you off track a little bit there. No, too, no, but like, it just what you're what you're pointing to is this is incidental learning that comes out of the activity, which is also equally important to me. Right. It's not just about that's like great. learning this specific skill. It's also like, how does this permeate other aspects of your growth as an artist? And, you know, the only thing that I would say at the end of this is that like, I would just, I make a very big point out of saying just because is not an answer that's acceptable in my room, you have to be prepared to defend your ideas. And if you're going to engage with a conversation with the culture through your art, also be prepared to discuss your ideas thoughtfully and to say, well, this is my art. That's all. What are you talking about? You just don't get it. Well, <laughs> I guess you can do that, <laughs> but it, it's not a sustainable uh, uh, debate strategy. <laughs> So anyway, um, yeah, and, you know, it's right. So this is it, it's great in a variety of ways. So being able to communicate more about it means you can potentially collaborate with others and all. It means a lot as far as and, and even it means you can get you can refine your art to even get closer to accomplishing what you want to, as opposed to just sort of wandering and mm -hmm. saying, I guess it's here because it's here. And, and the thing I also show my students is that I don't ask them to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. I do. I did this with a whole mess of He-Man characters years ago. Um, and I, I got a lot of value out of exploring these ideas. Like I took the character Fisto and I was like evaluating, okay, what, and I wrote little essays with each character redesign. And I was like, okay, what do I think about this character? He's big, he's cheerful. He's, he's like as strong as He-Man, but he is not nearly like, he's not, nobody parades him around like the most powerful man in the universe. And he's like, he's, you know, guy smiley, big jovial dude. And I was like, well, what if he was like Eternia's number one party animal? Right. And so I was like, well, what shapes would I use? And how could I Im imply strength, but also that like friendliness, softness, approachability? Well, let's just turn him into a freaking beach ball with a gigantic fist, you know? Um, do I stand by these designs today? Well, I don't know. I mean, this is a long time ago I did these, but it, it was a experiment that I did to explore how I might approach. Um, another one that I did a lot of changing on uh, was Adam and Cringer, addressing some of the obvious problems of that, of like how Adam looks just like He-Man, but paler. Well, we'll make him look younger the way they did in the 2002 series, but let's also make Cringer like a different kind of cat altogether. I mean, if Adam's gonna grow, why can't Cringer grow when he turns into a battle cat? So anyway, my point is, is that um, this isn't something that I'm just, <laughs> the thing I tell my students is like, I'm not just pushing you around because adults like to push kids around, although some adults do like to push kids around. I'm asking you to do this because I've done it myself and I've gotten a lot of value out of it and I think you will too. So, <sighs> Very that's nice. a lot. Um, that is a break? lot. That yeah. is a that is an intense exercise and as approachable as it you know may seem, uh, it's like, oh, let's watch cartoons and whatnot, but yeah. Pretty deep, pretty, but which we can unpack further after the break, right? I, I yeah. If if you think it's a good time, uh, I think it might be a good time to take a break. Um, we'll come back in a minute and a half and sort of unpack just very briefly some of the th things that yeah. we're teaching. Dig a little deeper in some of the things that we're teaching through this activity, um, and what kinds of values you can look forward to in pursuing these kinds of character design exercises. Um, before we do that. We gotta thank some people who make this show possible. Those people happen to be the folks who support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Lena Duart is the website. And if you believe in me and Rob and enjoy what we're doing, if you believe in what we're doing, you can su support it in a sustainable way for as little as a dollar a month to help, you know, make the show more sustainable. You can also cancel your uh, your support at any time, but I would recommend that you stick around for at least a month to enjoy all the, you know, behind the scenes stuff. And I want to thank five people who have been supporting us on an ongoing basis basis first up brandon dayton thank you brandon for believing in us and what we do you can find brandon on twitter at brandon dayton dave three say longtime friend of the show been on the show a couple times himself we love dave say you can find dave on twitter at dave say and gail bushman another illustrator that you can find on instagram at nightingale art thank you gail and carrie goble billick thank you carrie for supporting the show for so long you can find carrie on 
Twitter at Mushin Girl. And finally, Tim F. Thank you, Tim, for believing in us. You can join them all at patreon.com slash lean into art, where you will find all the shows that we make, as well as the extra leans, the shows that we record only for people who support us on Patreon. And it's sort of like Rob and me finding a topic live and on the spot. And they always turn into really interesting episodes. And those posts become an open mic thread where you can talk about wherever you want, whatever you want in a safe place with fellow leaners, patreon.com slash lean into art. Thank you to everybody who supports us there. It means a lot to us. It does. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to hear from, to, you know, get that support. That's yeah, a great signal. Speaking of signals... And now it's time <clears throat> for the second half of the show. Well, that was a quick little music stinger. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, what are we doing? What are we doing with this stuff? Um, so, character design challenge. Um, and actually, if I may, just for a second, I want to like really briefly talk about um, this comic I do called Amazon Academy. Oh, that's, that'd be great. Um, cause I, this is something that I, I also in the, in the, um, sort of the idea or the, the, the hope of explaining that this is stuff that I do, um, that I practice and it's, it's not something I'm just like imposing on my students all the time just because I'm one of those kinds of teachers. Um, I'm going to pull up one of the pages from the, you're gonna get to see a page that has not been published yet on the website. Ooh. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to pull up Clip Studio Paint so we can see what I'm talking about. Um, so here's a page in process. And I think about body language a lot of my characters, not just shape, size, line, and color, but also like the way the characters are, the movement is implied. And so here's this character on the far right named Theodora, who is, um, she's rigid. She is, um, she's, she doesn't like surprises. And she doesn't like change. So I thought, okay, whenever she is standing or moving, it should it should look very. Oh, she's also extremely powerful. So I was like, okay, so she, her movement should always look like you can't. Like if you tried to go come up and push her, she ain't moving, right? And when she when she puts her hand down on a desk, you hear it, right? Um, she's not a savage person, but she's a strong and sort of martial person, right? And then we have in the middle of the panel is this kid named Jordan who is very shy. Uh, he is, um, he's kind of a little bit eager to please. He is not, he's not super confident about himself yet. And he's really, really tall and lean. And so I thought, well, what if he was like, his movement is always like, he's a blade of grass and you could just flick him and he'll just go flying. Right. Um, and so like, whenever I'm thinking about the way they're moving, like if you look at Theodora here, she's standing and like, Again, it doesn't look like you're going to push her down, right? Whereas, like, Jordan, when Rose here just, like, gently guides him into the classroom, she's just gently guiding him, but look at the way his body's moving as he's reacting to that touch, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like a, like a blade of grass. That's, that's a really cool idea to have in mind looking at that character. And this is a conversation that Dan and I had when we were working on the book together. So I was like, well, I'm thinking about, in the terms of all the characters' growth, what starting point can I give them and how can that evolve over time? And I, and I told this to Dan because I, I wanted him to have that imp, that uh, food for thought when he's writing the character's growth, you know? So, like, I told him, like, right now, I'm thinking of Jordan like this. The way you write him, I'm thinking he is a blade of grass that gets just pushed around by the winds. And, like, Rose may just gently push him on the shoulder, but he's going to look like she's pushing him onto the ground, you know? Whereas Theodora is very stiff and rigid. Okay, well, as Theodora grows and becomes more flexible, her body language is going to change. And as Jordan grows more confident, his body language is going to change as a result. So I think about this a lot in my character design as well. So one thing I, yeah, I mean, you're, you're certainly living the, the method. <laughs> <laughs> and which which is reassuring i mean and it gives you a, a just a huge breadth of material to to bring out in class and, and whatnot to continue to just take branches on the conversation that i would imagine come up and uh one thing i love about this is that i see that's similar but not exactly the, the same thing but it's it's something that uh sometimes user experience designers do this for uis and it's it's uh it's it's a not uncommon thing to do to put into your portfolio and maybe have a light amount of commentary and but i think it's it th this this is a little bit of a um 
it runs a it runs a huge risk that I think your exercise does a great job navigating that when I see this, when someone sort of does sort of a, you know, an outsider redesign on someone else's app or website or what have you, you, you lack the context of the, of the whole project's history and behind the scenes and all the different constraints that they had to embrace due to, due to whatever logistics and finance and team culture and what have you, who knows. Um, and being of their time. So, uh, what I think is really interesting is you, this is a huge empathy exercise and intentionality exercise that, that you've, I think you, so you completely dodge that issue of the whole, um, you know, how many guitarists does it take to screw in a light bulb one and five to say they could have done it better, whatever. And <laughs> it, where you don't get caught up in that of thing of like, well, look at, you know, Hey, why did you just do it this way? Everybody, come on, Pff, geez, look at this. And it's, it's just imbued with this, with the curiosity and the thoughtfulness and the exploration and, um, and yet open where if that's where you start, if you have that surface reaction, great, follow that and explore. So I really love that about your activity. I think there'd be a way to turn this into a, like a, uh, just thinking out loud, like this could be a, a healthy design exercise, a version, a version of the whole design someone else's thing, with, but with tons more empathy and curiosity. Yeah, yeah. And with with like the upfront mandate of this isn't about making it cool for you, you know, um, and, and like you're pointing at something that like, yeah, this is this is part of the design of the exercise is that it indulges in that fantasy of, well, if they just asked me, I would have made it so much better. Right. And like, OK, that's what we're doing. If we're asking you make it better. But, you know, it's going to in a very playful way force you to encounter that it isn't as easy as it looks but that's not the, that's not exactly the point you know that's part of the overall experience that you're trying to generate here is that like let's encounter those frictions and i'm going to make it hard for you because and i tell my students this i'm going to come around the room now while you're working and i'm going to ask you why you did what you did so be prepared to tell me if you didn't write it down you better have it in here that you better defend yourself because i'm going to ask why and if you don't have a good reason you know it, that that's too bad i'm gonna be sad and I, I, cause I, I don't like things that are done for no reason. You know, don't make, don't make baby Jersey cry is something that I say in my classroom. Um, but, but it, it, it gets you to encounter and engage with that fantasy. If anybody just asked me in a way that is playful, approachable, but then asks you to step in and say like, Oh, the real complexity of this issue is that I have to really do some heavy duty inferencing. I have to look at what is said what is around that thing? What is around that character? And what do I think was the intention behind this? It's because another reason I choose obscure and out of the way cartoons is because one of the reasons they're obscure is they probably, I mean, unless it's a copyright thing, like in the case of Mighty Orbots, which is an excellent cartoon, but just the rights are all mixed up. But sometimes it's that it wasn't a very successful show. Well, if it wasn't a very successful show, there was some kind of mis malfunction in the production. And so messaging got confused and that makes it all the more richer of, a, of an exercise because now you have to dig hard is to like what do you think they're really after with this thing um and how would i enhance that that signal that message so it's refl relying on your ability to inf uh, to infer but then also do role playing okay this is what the writer was trying to do here's what the, the show was trying to do for an audience even if it's a show where it's like, this is about selling toys. You know, we're introducing the dragon walker in this episode of He-Man because we got to move a lot of dragon walkers, you know? Okay, that is a perfectly reasonable motivation. How do we make it so that this thing, when you watch the show, not only do you get lost in the story, but you just have to own this thing, you know? I'm, okay, so wait, what did, uh, did that really happen? I, what? Selling the dragon walker? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing on that, but I mean, like I'm in the middle no, of doing no, this. I, I'm just telling it. It's, so <laughs> sorry. I was like excited for like a, a quick, you know, quick summary of like how that happened and, and did it turn out? Okay. Cause no, cause I the can dragon... easily see you to just, you know, tell a, a, like a quick story of like, well, and that's why after the dragon walker hugged, you know, man at arms and then jumped into the volcano, everyone knew that the dragon walker was just noble and amazing and whatever. Unfortunately, no. The Dragon Walker is one of those things that, like, there's a lot of memes built out of how, what a foolish idea for 
an adventure vehicle it was. It was a great toy. It was a really cool toy. But would you put it in a real world context, real world cartoon context? It's the silliest idea for a vehicle because it moves so slow and it's so awkward. Now, there is an episode with Stridor, the horse, is a robot horse. And there's one episode where um, he does a very similar thing to what you're describing. And like it, the episode ends with He-Man saying like, um, like Striders are injured and everything. And He-Man's like, well, after what he did today, he doesn't have to walk home. And he, I'm getting choked up thinking about it. He-Man oh. carries the horse home. And like, after, and like, I never cared about Strider at all as, as a character in the series. But then like, after I saw that episode, I was like, I kind of have to get Strider now. <laughs> so, so yes, you can do that. Um, and that's also like through writing too. Right. But, um, but anyway, just to point out that like it's it's a I think it's a worthy experiment to take in, to hold in one's mind all these different motivations, um, and what does this teach us? This teaches us how to make art in terms of service, which isn't the only way to make art, obviously, but it is a way to make art in a way that's sustainable for an artist. I mean, if you want to do this as a career, at some point or another you will be approached to do something that has some kind of service built into it and having the skill to look at the audience and take their position. Or if you can't take their position, investigate. And this is something I think you could speak to really well, Rob, is like this is something you do all the time as a UI UX designer is, um, well, you did that talk on like design like Columbo. Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. So that, that's um, having a, a like a wide a lot of bandwidth for for curiosity and attention to like what do the other folks who identify as solving problem problems through different skill sets need and like what is their definition of success what's your definition what's the shared like and uh d being able to uh well investigate and assemble this kind of picture and sort of you know, work through that as as a as a map and and keep it up to date because you're you're there uh curiously connecting the the purposes and how you can all make this thing happen. And uh, that's a, that's a way to let it, that's a, what a great skill of practice on top of, um, on top of all this, the uh, lot of interesting problem solving skills in this, in this exercise. Hmm. And I think I, I do like the idea of, of, of a challenge of how could this be turned into a, it, with just as much empathy and kindness, could, could this be done as a uh, UI redesign thing? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, if it helps, uh, a thing that I've stacked on top of it as a way to sort of like get them engaged with the ideas before we dig into shape, size, line, and color. And I did this with my current character design class. And it was it, it served two purposes. One is I want to learn all the, na the, the names of my students. And two is I want to get them engaging with this, this design principle as quickly as possible. And so I say, okay, our warm up while we wait for everybody to arrive is you got to, and I fold a bunch of pieces of paper and like, okay, you got to draw your name on this card and you have to draw it in a way that tells me who you are inside. Are you an intense person? Are you a kind person? Are you a sarcastic person? Are you a snarky person? Are you a witty person? Are you a clever person? Can you draw your name to make me feel that feeling, right? And they, they all look like, what? What are you talking about? That's weird. Why are you talking like a hippie? And I'm like, well, that's 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 part of a designer's challenge and a cartoonist's challenge is you got to think about this and you have to think about writing visually. How do you use shapes to to communicate that? So they're starting out already doing that, thinking about their own personal biography, so they feel like they got some skin in the game. And then when I do shape, size, line, and color, I can walk around the room and say like, "Hey, see," and this is what Brendan was doing right over here. Because when I look at Brendan's name, I see like this this is a kid with no malice in his heart. He is nothing but kindness and goodness because he uses all smooth shapes. He's like, "No, I'm not." And I'm like, eh, "That's what you that's what you did." <laughs> <laughs> so that is yeah fantastic also i that's a great warm-up to pair with it all too yeah um, yeah very fascinating so yeah this is great food for thought i love i love this uh this workout here cool um all right what um all i can ask for is that it's useful uh, the final thing i'll tag on the end and then we can take uh another break is part of the design of this exercise is is that um, a lot of what I do in the classroom is try to do an end run around the tyranny of the blank page, right? Um, a blank piece of paper is often one of the most frightening things we can ever encounter. It's like all, it's almost up there with public speaking, you know, and I see too many students, even young people who are just so afraid to throw it on that first line because what if I get it wrong? I'm like, okay, well, one, you will and you should. <laughs> this is where you should be failing is in a classroom because that means you're trying really hard. Um, but two is... Um, 
how can I get them halfway there so that they can start moving faster? Well, by working with other people's characters and using other people's designs as food for thought is well, like, how would I do this differently? Um, you're giving them a starting point without having to do any pre-designing, right? The design's already there, just improve it, right? So we're engaging with the, the topic and the activity very thoughtfully in a way that isn't asking them to build the house from scratch. Um, and then- I empathize with that approach very much. That's, uh, <laughs> I have a, uh, well, there's a, an ebook I created that is a choose your own adventure about making a video game that sets you up with Hmm. Whoa. Did I lose your rap? It's at creativecodekit.com. It's called Game Construction Kit. Underwater Tomato Ninja Edition. Well, let me pull that up on the screen. Video Game Construction Kit. Underwater Tomato Ninja. That's right. The, the whole premise of this book is that you're starting with a whole bunch of pre-made materials, assets, and chunks of code, right? So that you you can get going faster. Yeah. I mean, you start out in a from a position of success, and you can explore and still have a working game that which which means that you're you're not going through another path which can be can be also very rewarding but uh but it also can discourage lots of folks to have that that sort of the blank page equivalent of well i've been coding all this stuff and pieces work pieces don't work well no it, it all works with lots of tempting ways to then evolve it and that's that's the whole choose your own adventure, literally just jump. The sections are linked in the book and you just go wherever you want to go and mm. make the changes and see what that's like. Creativecodekit.com. Um, final, final thought before we go to the, the two minute uh, exercise section. Um, and we'll take a break between this and that. Um, is if you want to do an extension on the activity, at least in the case of these these cartoon characters, these character designs, is what I've had the students do in recent years is they have to then take their three designs, pick two, so one gets X'd out, well, don't literally X it out, but just like take two of them, and you're gonna create two opposite characters. So now you're introducing new characters into that world. You're not just refining ideas, but now you're creating something from scratch, but using them as a starting point by saying, how would I make an opposite of this character? Well, what does an opposite mean? Opposite in shape, size, line, Opposite in personality, opposite in body language, opposite in uh, outlook, combination of all those things. Um, you know, like you can do wholesale opposite or just physical opposite, but you know, worldview very similar. You know, and and in that in that situation, what you've then walked away with is now you've created two brand new pieces of fiction to, in, to introduce into that world or to run with and do your own thing with, right? Because like you can use another person's idea as a basis for meditation to create your own ideas. Um, so, that's but I leave, great. and I leave that for the end because that's all about risk diminishment, getting you more and more confident so that, okay, now you're ready to create your own thing, but let's just reflect off of that. And, and because you've already done the refining of the design, you're sort of building on your own ideas. You're building on your own thinking by creating that opposite. So. Yes. Um, so, right. That's the whole, uh, you're, you've, if you would have jumped there at first, that would be a giant a huge risk compared to um compared to at the end and now yeah okay, you're building upon your past success um hmm. and plus yeah that whole thing of 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 uh starting out at, at a point to tell a story with with you know such rich elements that's very empowering so a lot of huge benefit to these exercises cool well i'm i'm glad that it wasn't uh I mean, I've been I've been talking about this this workshop or this this activity for so long now. I I forget like if we've ever gone into great depth into like unpacking what it is, but it at the very least I feel validated that like okay I've thought this thing through pretty carefully, <laughs> and then on the surface it looks like oh how sweet Jersey gets to watch he made cartoons with children, which that's a part of it. I do enjoy that. I I, I I love listening for what are the kids like that I like in this thing. There was this this last week. I was like, uh, what characters did we enjoy? What characters did we like really not enjoy? And one kid raised their hand like, I loved Orko. And I'm like, whoa, my gosh, finally, somebody somebody I can talk to about this. Because usually it's just like, why does He-Man not have clothes? I'm like, yeah, I know. It's weird, but it's a barbarian cartoon. Um, like think about barbarian tropes, but this one kid was like, "Oh, Orko is so great. He's so sweet and kind to everybody." I'm like, "Yeah, I know, right?" <laughs> <laughs> 
so that is part of it but i mean the other part the, the other parts are much much more important to me and that's just like the the talking about orco with a kid is the icing on the cake for me so all right um do you want to do another break and then we'll dive into our two minute exercises for the this week mm-hmm. that sounds like a great way to wrap up the show awesome okay so in about two minutes we're going to get into doing two minute exercises and the time it would take you to do one of the exercises we're going to be back to talk about the exercises we're going to take on in in the next week ahead before we do that we got to thank some more people who make the show possible those people are us we make the show possible and uh, we work hard on other projects and think hard about it and take all that thinking and bring it into the lena tart cast and the thing that i'm thinking really hard about that i hope you will engage with uh, is another podcast that I do, and it's called Four Million Years Later. It is a, it's it's a different thing than Lena Tor in that it is about a pop culture show. It's about a cartoon series from the eighties called Transformers, and uh, an old friend of mine are watching an episode a week and then convening to sort of unpack and pick apart like really in great detail like what we think is happening and inferring what the writers were doing whether or not we feel they were successful putting together uh theories based on inconsistencies in the writing that is natural uh, natural inconsistencies that come out of such enormous and complex teams putting together these shows so rapidly and the the latest episode Episode seven, Fire in the Sky, is I feel like the Rubicon. If you if you listen to this one, you will either be all in or you will conclude that Jersey spends far too much time thinking about Transformers and you know, maybe should should uh, uh, talk to somebody besides the internet about it. Um, yeah, but it's it's you probably still won't be able to stop listening because <laughs> you just you're like, why? He's he just he's keep he's going still. Where's this going to go? <laughs> it's the episode called Fire in the Sky, and it's the first appearance of a character named Skyfire. Oh, yes, Jetfire was the toy. Skyfire was the character of the cartoon. We don't spend a lot of time talking about that, but what we do talk about is the relationship between Skyfire and Starscream and really unpack it and really examine every scene in the episode. It's like an hour and 40 minutes of us talking about a 21-minute cartoon, and there's no digression. It's all just careful, thoughtful uh, discussion on this cartoon from the 80s. So you can find it at 4millionyearslater.com or in your favorite podcatcher. If you have subscribed, and thank you for subscribing, um, giving us a review would be really, really helpful as we try to you know, find out who actually wants to engage with this stuff. So, But Rob, you make other things. You make a, uh, a workshop. Yeah, yeah. Um... Make, make a variety of workshops. And one recent one I co-created with uh, my creative collaborative partner in a variety of endeavors, uh, Kate Shield Stenzinger. Uh, we've, we've talked about goal planning for years on different podcasts and contexts. And it it's, was one of the things we wanted to do to sort of, how do we make this an approachable system to just invite anyone who wants to, to, to take a look at it in a, lot of, in, in a similar way? Because what we try to do is, is hit goal planning from, from a variety of angles that address um, like, well, maybe let's put on a more creative hat, more think about the future. And now let's think about uh, what if we just boiled it to one word or did, uh, you know, just drew a picture or all these kinds of ways of looking at it. So what we have are, um, well, seven total activities, depending on which version of this that you get. And it's, a, it's uh, packaged up as both a, a journal where you can get this you know, electronic printable PDF it's called the Where Next Journal. And it's activities to design your goals and the story of your future. And then that is also sort of the, the core thing in a workshop we created, which includes the, the full version, the 30 page version of the journal called Goal Setting Using Design Plus Storytelling. And the whole idea is that when you, when you do a bit of reflection and goal planning and use sort of different creative and analytical ways of looking at it uh, and encapsulate it like a creative exercise uh, like it's like a couple of different ways of, of uh, describing it as a story all of a sudden well if someone says hey what are you working on what's the thing you're ex all excited about lately well you're pretty well prepared and you can use it for um, pitching what you're working on you can use it for uh, just sort of you know talking with whoever you collaborate with in life it's a it's meant to be a helpful tool and not just like a one time one and done exercise and um, anyway, so like there, it's it's um, yeah. Hopefully, uh, uh, if you're if you're curious and you want to you know, just sort of you know dabble into it, the we have a free version of the journal, a ten page version of of the PDF that you can just you get for free. Go to gum.co. Is there a link shortener version? Gum.co 
just CO, uh, WNXTJ for the journal. And then if you want, you can, you can buy the full 30 page version version there, but for a little bit more, you could get the entire workshop where we'll walk you through the whole process and you'll get some more background and, and fun and, uh, and story that, uh, that help you with this whole process. And it's only like 28 minutes, but that's uh, all that is at uh, gum.co slash G S U D S G suds. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> That sounds funny. So the, <laughs> this whole thing, uh, so this goal setting using design plus storytelling plus the where next journal, that's actually, uh, and my Gumroad, uh, not my Gumroad, uh, Skillshare profile as well. So I do teach workshops at Skillshare. If you go to Skillshare.com, search for Rob Stenzinger, you'll find goal setting using design plus storytelling there as well. And the last thing we hope you'll check out is the Lean Into Art Discord. Yes, we are on Discord now. And uh, Lean Into Art has a forum. And you can, whoops, let's scroll up to topic requests. So like there's three public channels where you can like promote, uh, propose topics for the show. There you can comment on, on episodes. Please mention the title or number of the episode when you post a comment. And then there's also the challenges quests, which is the area where we're going to be posting about our two minute uh, challenges or two minute uh what do we call those? Two minute practices. And then there's also three channels that are only for people who support us on Patreon. So if you are a Patreon supporter, you can join the Discord there and post in our social channel or a gentle town where you can, you know, it's okay to ask for a high five, something you're working on that you want to say, hey, did I do good or what? Yes, you did. Um, and there's Castle Level Up, which is an area for you to post some work in progress and get some feedback from the circle of trust, uh, your brain trust. And that's the invitation link will be in the show notes for this episode, both at patreon.com slash leanatuart and on leanatuart.com. Okay. So time for, and we need a jingle for this, two minute practice. Two okay. minutes to practice. <laughs> two minutes to practice. All right. We don't have a jingle yet, right? No, we don't. Okay. <laughs> All right. Phew. All right. So, okay. The two minute practice sessions, the whole point of this is to encourage, uh, I mean, we've encouraged all sorts of creative challenge type uh, endeavors. Uh, we do the art sound off thing. We've done the leaning to art quests way back in the day. And you can get so much benefit by just reducing all this down into something that has just longer term value instead of, you know, you know, by all means still use that other mechanism. It has, there's, there's great things that you can accomplish through, through creative challenges. I even have a workshop about customizing creative challenges to, to get what you want out of the creative challenge. Anyway, um, it's, well, it's called customizing your next creative challenge <laughs> just to get that out there and solve the mystery. Um, okay. So why do this practice small things frequently? Um, this, these two minute practices are meant to encourage and, and explore all kinds of different habits related to being a creative human being uh, and succeeding at your, uh, in your business art and a healthy lifestyle. So all sorts of ways that just sort of feed into you as this, you know, creative entity in the world. But um, like, and it, some of this is, is just looking at like, well, what do I want to practice more and whatnot too? Like I have a lot of variety of selfish angles on this too. And I'm excited that from what I can tell, like there's some leaners out there who have been reacting to this and seem, you know, interested and intrigued. So this is great because I think the variety will lead to good places. And what we'll do in this segment of the show is sort of just remind what the two minute thing's about and talk about how our recent two minute practices went and maybe things we saw in the world. And then just sort of pick one to highlight and say, this might be a, a, um, a worthwhile one to consider, not prescribing it. And uh, then we'll just keep doing that. This is, our, this is a new segment on the show that okay. we're feeling out, figuring out. Exploring. And so the first, what you proposed or what we both proposed with last week's episode was the first two minute challenge or two minute practice to take on was brainstorm what kind of practices we might want to take on for the two minute practice. And yeah, so do you want to want to talk about some of the things that we all shared I think between us and some leaners? Yeah, let's let's uh, let's do that. So um, one of the places where, like, as Jersey mentioned, that you can be you know sharing and having conversations about this, well, is in the Lean Into Art Discord. And um, let's see. So Retro Outro um, shared the, that. Um, let's see that there's a. Um, 
there's this help that uh, just kind of like feeling this out as far as the like, like this is kind of like what you're talking about, right? There's a um, uh, an artist, Aaron Blaze, who has a technique about drawing right. hands instead of uh, drawing the uh, the arm and then the hands at the end of it. And that will help with uh, improved expressive posture and stuff like that. So, and I would say, yeah, kind of like, like the scope of this, if, if you could practice, if you want to make that your two minute practice, awesome. That sounds great. Um, and, you know, again, you, you might think, well, gosh, wait a minute, how many hands and arms and stuff could I draw in two minutes? The point isn't to make you into a, a, a machine of, you know, giant productivity. It's just about the long-term investment of now you did it once and you know continuing on from there where this kind of thing adds up um we had a um jumping around there was um another leaner uh, great sea monster shared that um uh well this kind of thing will add up over time if you do two minutes every single day that's actually 12 hours in a year hmm. um which you know interesting to consider that you probably will have some kind of effect in, in, in being influenced slowly over time. 12 hours. Um, yeah. What about you, Jersey? You got some, well, it's just that, that, that's, that's an interesting food for thought there because like I noticed that my first practice that I shared on the discord was me wrestling with this idea of seesawing between skill building toward, um, you know, leveling up, uh, existing skills or acquiring brand new skills. Like I remember writing the word like music, you know, like one of the things I would love to do in the next year or two is actually practice a musical instrument and like get back in touch with making music. I, I did it as a child. I played trombone in like middle school and high school, but like I never really learned any, like I never made my own music and I never learned any other instruments beyond that. Um, so I remember writing that down, but I thought like two minutes, what can I really do in two minutes? It doesn't feel like th that's going to be a, uh, a thoughtful enough engagement. So then I started like scaling back. Okay. What are little tiny things I could do? Well, like maybe I could do like a sketch of a thing a day. Um, and then, um, the really, the thing I'm really grateful for with, uh, the leaners posting in the, the discord and you posting in the discord was seeing all of your different approaches to it helped recontextualize. Yeah, actually this could be something as simple as just introducing like planking into the day, right? Two minutes to plank, right? A minute is a long time. If you ever tried to do it, it's a really long time to do that. Uh, I don't know if I'd be able to do two full minutes of it, but um, like, so then that like brought me to the other side, to the other side of the seesaw, seesaw of like, no, this is just introducing a practice where it isn't results oriented. It's not, there's no goal in mind. It's just the, the matter of checking in on a thing. I'm still kind of, the seesaw is still moving back and forth on it um, for me, but because, um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I mean, you're the, yeah. you're the one of us who really very effectively turned your regular creative challenge practice into product development. Yeah. And, uh, and I've, I've, I've already high-fived you a bajillion times about your example on that. And that's where I want to go with creative challenges, but this is purposefully not that. Yeah. This is like. Yeah you guess you pr maybe you could make a product out of what as a side effect of of two minutes over accumulating over time maybe well because like when you said like once you pointed out that's 12 hours in a year i'm like because i one of my um so we were, we've all been sharing different sticky notes in the mm -hmm. discord you should join the discord so you could share your sticky notes on the practices you want to do um and i put two minute world prop study Right. So like go to the library, gather a whole bunch of like books on medieval um, weaponry and architecture and things like that. Take it home, have that book stack sitting in an accessible place and like, OK, set the time for two minutes, open up a book, pick a thing, draw it, draw it on a sticky note. And now I'm slowly I'll have 12 hours of research over the course of a year for a fantasy project that I might want to do next year. Right. So that is product development. And like, I, I feel almost a little bit shameful about thinking about it that way. <laughs> almost, <laughs> almost, um, but not quite. <laughs> Time's money. <Pat. laughs> uh, but then, yes. but then I also, I love the idea of just saying like, okay, like let's just bake in two minutes in the day where I'm just going to do something to rest my body or stretch my body, do something physical with my body so that I'm not, um, always developing products. Like let's, let's also develop me as a human. Right, which is something that you put is part of the the ethos of this thing. So, 
Yeah. So, I mean, did you want to share a few of your ideas as far as uh, additional? Sure. Um, um, you share a, f- yeah. a bit of that? Yeah. yeah, so um I I you know my latest one was exercise two exclamation points stretching stretching my arms legs back uh I don't stretch enough. Um maybe doing 2 minutes of sit-ups or push-ups, you know, because this is a sedentary job that I lead. Um and I worry about especially as I enter my middle age maintaining the machine, you know. Uh or or um Brandon Dayton just wrote this marvelous blog post on meditation and how it's improved his life. Did you did you see it by any chance? I did. I need to re- uh, check that out. Oh my gosh. It's, it's, it's a challenging read. He was going through some serious stuff and he had some, like he really wrestled with meditation. Um, I think in a way that felt very uh, visceral and real to me as somebody who took it very seriously years ago. And so like, I was like, well, maybe do two minutes of meditation in the afternoon. And I'm like, well, how much can really be accomplished? Stop it. <laughs> I started talking myself out of right away. Stop talking about how much we can be accomplished. Just do the two minutes, you know? Uh, and then I put, going back to, you know, like skill building, product development, two minute animal study, you know, like maybe I'd like write down a list of 30 animals, you know, as like things I've never, animals I've never drawn, do a two minute gesture sketch of an animal on a sticky note. Um, or then, like I was saying, the 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 props and um, the, the world building kind of like research Um I don't know. I don't know where I am. I, I think part of me wants to fight against my instinct or it's, that's not instinct, fight against my habit and say, just do something for the pure practice of it, like doing setups for two minutes, like doing pushups for two minutes, do something physical that isn't going to accumulate anything on paper. Yeah. How interesting. So, yeah, I mean, this is, this is practicing practice. That's, that's the, I mean, you're wrestling with the core concept which to me um sends a signal of this is the of, of worthiness for this kind of thing and i and and how it really does have a different um idea behind it besides you know it's this is not a creative challenge it's not a 30-day thing not a week not even eight hours it's two minutes <laughs> and that's it in its nature, very different. Like you could accomplish this. There, there probably would be different contexts where you could have a two minute elevator ride and have your practice done Mm -hmm. depending on what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So I I've got sneaky accumulate accumulation things in mind as well, where it's like, Oh, I could turn this into a product maybe eventually whatever, not quite as, uh, hardcore as you are about that but it's you know it's it's leaking in like should i read my list quick yes please all right so i'll try to go through this pretty quick but i came up with um over i did i did two minute practice basically every other day i didn't even pull off all seven days and um i did uh um i did the whole two minute thing i played a uh i i love the 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 um musical theme from the video game devil's crush and so i played I use the command line to play that just for two minutes because it's longer, right? But it just plays for two minutes. And actually now I'm getting really familiar with the song where I'm like, "Uh oh, because it's getting near the end. Anyway, well, so we'll see how that goes. But uh, here's the ideas I gathered in these practices. And and, uh, all right. Critique a past comic I made one page or panel at a time. Uh, Speed draw a pose from a pose website. Uh, Preparing scales to practice guitar. Um, practice scales on guitar, gather drum practice videos from YouTube, practice drumming, organize my desk, stretch, find a new web comic to read, sit ups and push ups, read jokes from a book of kids jokes, fast sketch from my book self of references, doodle a monster from my D and D manual, plan a background, joyful playlist, pull ups, plank. Um, look at my recent bookmarks from web browsing. Look at my portfolio, compliment something, breathe. Sketch to fill a page of doodling. Review inspiring quotes and affirmations. Look at my goals. uh, Gratitude brainstorm. Write as many words that come to mind. (laughs) Um, So, and then it started to occur to me that there's a ways like, uh, I'm like, uh uh-oh, could get ambitious with this. I could make combo practices. Two minutes to set up, two minutes to practice. I don't know. Danger. I don't know. Um, 
sketch an object from three angles. Draw on large paper. So getting a new context. Burpees. Um, mm. That's that exercise. Yeah, exercise where you, know, you squat, plank, push up, jump, all mm-hmm. that stuff. Um, mm. Yeah, pull ups. Oops, repeat. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a genuine mistake. I forgot I wrote pull ups the other day. Uh, finger push ups. Dis- um, describe love. <laughs> describe darkness. Describe light. <laughs> and I stopped myself after that one. Uh, <laughs> juggle. And finally, pick books off my shelf and say how it inspires me. Mm. Yeah. One thing I missed, business stuff. I did not brainstorm business stuff. Mm. Not really. And I meant to. (laughs) Part of like thinking about this where I'm like, oh, I'm going to get this mechanism. I'm going to, you know, slowly build this, get better at, uh, you know, you know, my general entrepreneurial habits and stuff, right? Where. Mm, I, yeah, yeah. And I didn't, I did, I thought I, pretty much none of them. <laughs> Interesting. That category. Interesting. Yeah. That I didn't have anything like that either. I mean, well, I mean, product development in this form of like uh, asset generation or research um, generation. But um, as far as like going to like improving my website, you know, uh, the, that was one of the goals that I set up for 2020 is like in, improve the messaging on my website to uh, attract more appropriate and like find better matches between me and clients faster. Or I shouldn't say clients, partner orgs. I guess that would be like the, the, the people that I want to work with. Um, and gosh, that's something that I, I could be putting two minutes a day into, right? Two minutes of just thinking, looking at a paragraph and just like, if you could change one thing about it, what would it be? You got two minutes, go. Yeah. Um, like honestly, two minutes to uh, generate a list of things you want to fix on your website. Um, mm. Two minutes to pick any piece of copy from your website. And so make a I think version. both of us have a proclivity to add complexity to the things that we do to increase the challenge and, and by thereby increase the payoff. And I feel like that is that, is the practice I most need to work on is not doing that. Let's do something for the sake of doing it. When I was, even when I was taking meditation seriously, when I started out, it was all about like, I got to find inner peace and calm. I got to find, I got to do it. You know, if I just sit quiet enough, hard enough, I'll do it, you know? And then eventually like that point came where it's like, no, I'm actually just enjoying this. And when I started to enjoy it and just like check in for the sake of checking in on it, that was when I started to feel myself really kind of calm down. Um, and it became something I looked forward to rather than something I just had to do to check in on to like, you know, level up. Um, and that's still with me. That's still part of me. Um, I, I, I know that I spend a lot of my energy defining my value through the work that I make. And while I think I have a healthier relationship with it now than I did when I was younger, it's still there. And it's, I feel like this is an opportunity for me to just like to practice something purely for the sake of practicing it. So um, are we going to use this section to declare what we're going to practice this week and then check in at the top, top of the practice session next week? All right. What's the best we can do to come up with something that's purely for the sake of practice? Yeah. So of the things that we talked about, or does this mean like we have to like just think of something right now, which we can. I, I wrote down a bunch of business ideas just while you were talking too, so... <laughs> um, which I don't know if they would qualify for the, just the sake of, but like, yeah, yeah. like you know, asset generation is like kind of yellow light for me, but like, eh, we'll avoid that. But um, research, critique your product pages, that kind of thing, messaging, brainstorm, you know, mm-hmm. advertising, brainstorm, stuff like that. The business. Thing. <sighs> but I don't think those are really purely for the sake of practice practices. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Gosh, because even when I think of exercise, that's also about like maintaining the machine. Like there's like, there's an end goal in there. Um, well, what if it's weird exercise? What does that mean? I don't know. I'm making it up. So uh, weird, like uh, unfamiliar exercise. So I don't know, like some different... Um, Hmm. Oh, I know. I know what I'm doing. You gave me, you, you, you pushed me there. I'm, oh, I'm oh, going to, I'm going to commit to um, a two minute uh, art meditation every day for the next oh, seven days. Just move the pen for two minutes? Move the pen for two minutes. Yeah. Okay. 
that's perfect. I like it. Because uh, that, that that doesn't generate anything that I that I find to be like shareable information. Um, its benefits are largely invisible. And if there is a benefit, it's basically just like mellowing me out before I start working. Hmm. So and like that, that's, yeah. that's it. And so the, it's essentially, um, what, how big a piece of paper? Um, I think I'm going to dig out one of my sketchbooks, which is like, um, uh, roughly half of a letter size sheet of paper. Okay. So I've got a bunch of small notebooks. Right. So a small, medium sized notebook, fill one page or whatever, two minutes. Just as far as I get with two minutes. As far as you get. Okay. All right. As far as you get. Okay. Um, that, that is cool. So let's make that our highlight. So that's, so every uh, part, part of the segment is like, let's highlight a practice and mm-hmm. we'll, 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 you know, we could both be doing that practice or neither of us be doing that practice. We're just going to highlight a practice. And I think I'm going to happen to, I, I might, I'm going to do this one too this week. Oh, are you? Okay. Yeah. This is by no means a prescription that everybody do this and share your results. This is more like we're just declaring this is the one that we're taking on, or we might do one one week where we both do a different thing, but we'll highlight it to say like, this is the thing we're declaring, go to the lead into our discord to see how it goes. Cause we'll be checking in with, um, you know, not necessarily like I'm going to be sharing all my warmups, but I'll be like checking in to say like, yeah, I did it today. And this is how I feel. That sounds great. So exactly. Okay. Right, if you feel like sharing, that's, that's fantastic, but it's, that's not really the point. It's yeah. um, the main point is practicing practice and doing small things to have long-term effect. Mm-hmm. Great. So it's, yeah. Um, just quick reminder. If you're like, wait a minute, I missed last week's episode. The gist of it, you pick something to practice, you pick a way to time yourself you give it a try and celebrate. Hopefully that you, you're like, yeah, I practiced or do something to be like high five yourself. Uh, take a note, how'd it go? You know, could be just, you know, uh, thumbs up sideways or down, whatever. Just keep it simple. Keep it short. Do this mm-hmm. for six more days and then look back on the seventh day and, and you know, how'd it go? How do you feel now? Um, that's it. That's your seventh note. And then keep going. Mm-hmm. Great. Rob, I think we did a podcast. I think we did, Jersey. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, this, is, this is a fun one. Um, we record the show every week, usually on Thursdays, but lately it's been on Wednesdays because I've got a lot of scheduling stuff going on. Um, we stream it live at twitch.tv slash lean into art, and then we collect it as a podcast at leanintoart.com and patreon.com slash lean into art. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of leanintoart.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger, also of leanintoart.com. And I'm Rob Stenzinger, places like Instagram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart. And you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.